there are a lot of presenters, um, me included, that will pull information together, that we read articles, see something, see somebody else speak. One of the things that I love about John is that he's the, he's the person who creates a lot of that content. Um, he's actually gone out and met in person and interview and dug into a lot of the vendors that say that they're using AI. Um, it'll be interesting to see um, if you have thoughts on whether any of that is true, to what extent, I suspect we'll hear that. Um, so John is going to be delivering um, the closing keynote, then we're going to go into the panel discussion, and then um, we'll, we'll wrap up for the day in, I don't know, an hour and a half or something like that. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, everybody, for turning up. Thanks, Google. Um, anybody else I need to thank? Oh, God, wait till you see this panel. Holy crap, I just want to get to the panel because it's four of the most cantankerous and opinionated people I know. Um, and they don't agree on anything, <laughs> right? And so I'm hoping to organize a food fight with them once I'm done with my little spiel here. Uh, so, so I'm M. John Sumser, and I run something called HRExaminer.com, which if you're not familiar with, please, please stop by the website. We publish two or three interesting articles every week about the edges of HR. Um, and an annual analysis of the state of the art of intelligent tools in, in uh, HR technology. I use the phrase intelligent tools advisedly. I have yet to see any AI um, in the place. There's a lot of machine learning and that's, that's math, right? And it's very interesting math, but there's nothing intelligent about it. What, what machine learning does is it learns all about the past and synthesizes the past into something that you can use today, but it's only as good as the past. It's absolutely only as good as the past. And, and what I'm looking for in intelligence is something that's able to imagine a future and help you navigate the future. So my deal with these sorts of talks is I always want to tell you what the takeaways are so you don't have to stay awake for the rest of the talk. And there are five things if you get two or three of them, it's worth your time. The first one is that models are simplifications. And so everything that you see in intelligent technology is some mathematical model of some reality. And it's always going to be less comprehensive than the reality itself. And the theory is that all you really need to do is get a model up to the point where the result stream is good over time, but the risk in using models to understand things is that you miss factors that you don't understand right now. And being in the early stages of this technology, there's a high likelihood that we don't have the slightest clue about what we're doing and we're making some pretty big mistakes. And so the idea that models are simplifications is a reminder of something that's the third piece here, which is machines have opinions. It was the case up until four or five years ago that you put data into the machine, and what came back out of the machine was your data. What happens today is you put data into the machine, or the machine collects data in some way, and what comes out is that data filtered through a data model, right? And so the data model is the machine's opinion, and like all opinions, you need more than one of them to make a decision. You can't trust a machine to have the right opinion. You can't. You shouldn't. It's a bad idea. Um, we're at a stage where having really good questions is way better than having answers. And that's a change in management. It's a change in the way that we think about work. You know, a lot of the stuff we've heard about today is based on the idea that work is something that you can precisely define. And when you get it precisely defined, you can understand exactly who would go into that precisely defined thing. Well, let me tell you, if you can precisely define it, it's going to be automated. Right? And so, so that work of precisely defining stuff is really the first stage in the automation of uh, layers of work. And what happens is that people have to sit back and watch that when you automate work that way, and that's how we're going to do it over the next 50 or so years, we're going to automate by understanding better and better what people do. Um, you have to watch it. You have to supervise that process. And one supervises that process 
by having good questions, not by having answers, because the machine is in the process of getting the answers. It's always going to be the case, you know, we have a kind of an interesting example of this at the national level right now, where paying attention to the details is a, is a complete and inherent part of decision making. And so one of the things I'll talk about is the importance of paying attention to fundamentals. <laughs> and the last thing is, it's not, it's not really holacracy, but what we're going to be managing is as different from the industrial world that our management models are built on as the industrial world was from the agricultural world that preceded it. And so we're going to have to learn how to think about management in radically new ways fairly quickly because the very first thing that we have to manage is these machines who are somewhat intelligent. So we're here talking about talent acquisition. One of the things I do every year is give a um, um, orientation talk at the HR Tech Conference. And so when, I, when it comes to talking about talent acquisition, this is the slide I use. There are, there are 30 observable areas in which software is being developed as a part of talent acquisition. Right, so when you hear the idea that what's gonna happen is we're gonna build a single system that does all of these things or that what you're gonna do in your company is link all of these things together, it requires a level of expertise that I don't think most companies have, right? These are like spices in the spice cabinet, and you have to know whether you're cooking Mexican or Indian or Thai uh, before, <laughs> before you go into the cabinet and start building stuff. So, isn't that pretty? God, I love fruit salad. I love a big bowl of cold fruit salad in the refrigerator, and the thing that I like most about it is how all of the pieces of fruit taste good together. When a machine analyzes this to see what it is, it gets this. Um, it's fantastic, it gives you a count of all of the fruits and all of the pieces. Um, and you'll notice that the bull has polka dots and there's a pile of polka dots on the side, right? That, that kind of that kind of error is the first kind of error that you see here. The other thing is that there was a decision made about what to count. And if you're like me and you really love fruit salad, what you know about fruit salad is it's the juice in the bottom. That's the whole thing. That's the best part. Particularly when it gets a little bit of whipped cream in there. Ooh. <laughs> they didn't count juice. <laughs> right? right? And so the model was simplified because the model adequately allows you to write the next recipe, except for the messy thing about cutting a bowl and a spoon and a pile of polka dots by a third. You could figure out how to cut this recipe by 66% and make a smaller batch of it. It just doesn't get at the thing that's most wonderful about fruit and fruit salad, which is the experience of the fruit and the fruit salad. So this is, this is a problem that every single data model has. And this is a problem that every single mathematically engineered machine learning model has, is that it only looks at what's measured, right? And so you make early decisions in your process about what you're managing and measuring, and that's the limits. That's the limits, so the place where these things make errors is in the juice, is in the things that don't get measured, is in the things that you have to have to make the things that are measured go together, right? And so that's the fruit salad. That means, right, what this is, is the machine's opinion of what the fruit salad is. That's the opinion right there, that's the opinion. The machine has this opinion. Um, and if you just took all of those pieces, you'd get something close to a fruit salad but you wouldn't get a fruit salad because it wouldn't have the juice. Um, and so, so the question that you have to ask when you're overseeing these tools is what's missing, right? What is this thing doing because it doesn't have all of the bits of data that it needs to have a comprehensive view of the universe? Now maybe it doesn't need a comprehensive view of the universe. 
but maybe it does, and that's the question that you have to ask about each data model that you encounter. This gets crazy. Um, you know, we were talking about GDPR earlier in the day. There is a new, does everybody know about the new California privacy law? It's kind of GDPR for California, and what it means is that every company in the United States is going to have to ab abide by GDPR level criteria in their privacy things, and that gets right at who owns the content. It's my resume in your database. It's my resume in your database, and, and is it? So I've been wrestling with, with analogies, um, and, and I don't have any good ones yet, but, but sort of like if I fall out of an airplane into your snowbank and I get up and walk away, who owns the imprint? Right, that's the, that's the question here is my data in your system has some sort of an impact and if I want it removed, if I want to exercise my ownership rights, how far into your data does my ownership extend because you built on the basis of me? Real problem, real question, it's going to be an issue. Um, uh, then after that, who owns the insight that's inside of the thing? Do the people who wrote the algorithms own the insight? Do the people who write so... So if you buy from a vendor and their analysis of your data gives you some insight, is it their property, is it your property? Whose property is that insight? And, and what's owned and ownable in that? And then this whole universe of who owns the data is, it's way more in play than you'd think. And, and it's not like it was. We got here in a process where Employers owned everything about the employee. Uh, you know, it's, it, there's 150 years ago, slavery was outlawed, but we've, we've continued the ownership of human beings pretty consistently. A lot of the models we use to think about management have to do with ownership. We call talent assets or capital. This is all part of a change that's going to happen where we learn how to think about people as something other than property. The next piece of this is who makes the decision. So imagine that you've got a thousand resumes, you put them into one of these machine learning hoppers and, and a hundred resumes pop out the bottom. And you move on there from go, who made the decision? Who cut, who cut those people? Was it the vendor or was it you? And if there is an error in that process that results in some sort of civil liability for discrimination, say, is that your problem or theirs, right? So there's a, there's a really big opening question about who's got the liability of this whole thing. And, and I'll tell you that the software companies will all say the employers have the liability. Um, and, and I'm starting to hear that software companies won't sign licenses where they accept responsibility for their data models. But if they don't accept responsibility for their data model, it's, it, I can't imagine that this business is going to go very far because um, you, can't ask the, you can't ask the customer to take responsibility for your thinking unless they have the ability to change it. So this who has liability question, one of the people on the panel is Heather Bussing, who has a, a whole fistful of opinions about who has liability in employment decision making, and we'll talk about that some more in the panel. But this question again is who owns the result? Like, you know, it's, it's maybe a little easier to understand if a Tesla runs over somebody. Is it Tesla's fault or the driver's fault? That same ethical question is going to percolate through all of the places where we bring intelligent tools into our systems. So the last piece that I'm going to leave you with is we're headed into a time where managing intelligent tools is going to be what we do. And it's different than managing people. And it's different than anything that you've ever heard about. So <laughs> it's my view that within five or six years, most scaled companies will have a library of data models for each person. And there might be 10 or 15 
One of them might have something to do with attention, retention and attrition, promotability might be a track, um, learning gaps. And each one, of these, each one of these models is probably going to be the product of some process that isn't inherently directly aligned with all the other processes. So the models are going to have differing opinions about the person. It'll be a committee of machines with differing opinions about the person. So that's the first thing. And we have to figure out how to use that data that'll have conflicts in it. It isn't any different than managing um, 360 degree feedback kinds of things. You have a bunch of different opinions that you have to wait somehow. But there's this next thing, which is that all data models wear out. They wear out. And they wear out in the following way. When you build a data model, it's set to learn something. And it turns chaos into order. Over and over, it turns chaos into order. That's what they do. Eventually, the environment has lots of order in it. And when it gets lots of order in it, it stops learning. And when it stops learning, all sorts of bias can float in from places that you have it. And what you want to be able to do is figure out how to keep the model learning. Um, and so when it wears out, like a pair of tires, you have to replace it. So now you're talking about 10 or 15 data models per employee plus replacements plus some work on what does it take to make the models better. And that, looks, that starts to look like, well, this thing is an incubator for um, stem cells. Right? You, and, and so it holds like 5,000 test tubes and you incubate, the ste you incubate the stem cells inside of these specialized tools. I think we're going to have things like that. And I've seen some early work like that where every data model has a set of attributes that you're monitoring about it. And when the dashboard indicates that the data model is not as useful as it might be, there's a replacement being developed underneath it. And these can be relatively automated processes, but we're going to have to learn how to think about them and learn how to deploy them. So I didn't hear this earlier in the day. The whole key here is that if your data isn't governed properly, you're shit out of luck. Excuse me. <laughs> out there, I'm sorry if your kids heard that. <laughs> the last decade or so of SaaS software wasn't something that you could um, tailor to your use, but you could customize workflows like nobody's business, and you could name fields like nobody's business. And, and so, if you go out and look in your organizations, it's not unusual to find recruiting departments with a couple hundred different workflows, with uh, different nomenclature for the same thing across all of those workflows. And a, and a learning system can't learn anything when the same thing is named differently. There's some tools emerging that might help with that, but they're a little, little far away. If you want to get started with this stuff now, you have to do a data governance process. And the data governance process looks like getting all of the stakeholders who have names for stuff together to the point where you can make decisions about standardizing on names for stuff so that you can start having um, larger volumes of data to solve problems with. So the very first thing that you have to do to really get this going is take care of and manicure your data. And the second thing is you have to have a problem to solve. This was covered pretty well during the day. Having a problem to solve, I don't know. It's how I learned how to use spreadsheets and that sort of thing is not by understanding what they do, but by trying to do something with it. And so having an internal problem that you're trying to solve is a much better way of getting down the road with, with these tools. It says, it says um, Arigato. On the, on the top because I was in Japan all last week and I'm a little uh, jet lagged from it. Um, but, but one of the things I learned that I want to leave you with as a, as a closing thought is HR and recruiting both are radically different based on the problem set that you're trying to solve. And so in Japan, 
Annual attrition is about 4%, and people make two or three job changes over the course of their life. And so the volume of resumes and the volume of work is much more compact. Second, branding in Japan is almost always about what a great place our company is to work because alliance to organizations is, is a big deal. So if you were to take American views of recruiting to Japan and try to teach them how to do employment branding, they're already doing it. Teach them how to do volume management, they don't have the problem. Um, <laughs> and so, so what I learned is that something I've always thought was true, recruiting is at least culturally specific and probably specific to your company. And so what you have to watch as this technology rolls out is the way that, the way that vendors have to organize to make money is by believing that there's a standard set of answers to a standard set of problems. And the way that you have to differentiate competitively is by not believing that. And so there's an inherent tension in the relationship that you're gonna have with providers of this technology. So with that, I'm gonna ask my esteemed panel to come up and while they're coming up, I'm gonna introduce them. So Jeff Dunn, who is looking very Intel-like, happens to be the guy who runs Intel's college recruiting operation. Heather Bussing, who I know personally, um, <laughs> because I'm married to her, um, <laughs> is, is an employment attorney and, you know, she, she also, I, I, I don't know how many of you would follow something like this, but she wrote the research at Burson on engagement. So she is a, a phenomenal engagement expert as well as that. Richard Rose now, it took me a while to understand Rose now, two syllables, runs people analytics for Facebook. And he, if you, if you haven't run across Richard yet, um, He's passionately dedicated to expanding the universe of people who understand and care about people analytics. Um, and so uh, make it a point of following him on Twitter or something because, because he's doing something that you need to know about. And then Derek Zeller, is there anybody in here who doesn't know who Derek Zeller is? <laughs> Derek, Ze Derek nice Zeller, huh? Yeah, I'm sorry, but it's nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, his middle name is The Man. Uh, <laughs> and he currently, uh, besides being a writer, he currently does recruiting solutions and channels for engaged talent, which is a company that does the most interesting thing. They can predict the likelihood that you will be willing to take my call about a new job without knowing anything about the insides of your company. Um, and, so, and so they have this theory that a company is, you, you know how microphones work, you can talk into them, but you can also use them as a speaker. The sound will come out of a microphone. They think that companies are like that too, that internal processes are visible externally if you just understand what data to look at. And so it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. So let's start. See, these are all the questions. You can tell if you want to go or not. Um, <laughs> So, so Jeff's question is, and, and, and the way we're going to do this is, is the named person gets tossed the ball, and then it's a food fight after that. Okay. All right? And, and let me give you the, actually, you can pick who assaults you, so. <laughs> <laughs> Would that be a fruit salad uh, fight? Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Whipped cream. Whipped cream. Uh, so, so the question is, every, everybody who's built a resume in the last 25 years has been coached in how to beat the system. And there's a, there's a pretty solid argument that the reason that you have resumes is so that you can beat the system. And now there's new evaluation tools in place that are not keyword oriented. How do you coach people how to beat the system? So it's, it's a moving target. First of all, the, the idea of just putting in some keywords so that it comes up in your search results is, is going to go away as these models change. So it's more of loading up the resume with words and phrases and all the synonyms we've been talking about. It's showing results and accomplishments and more numbers. Um, 
If you don't know exactly what the system is trying to catch, you're going to dump more in so you have more likelihood of sticking and that it's going to come up on somebody's radar. Um, it also involves not only just putting down what you think they're looking for, but it's going and doing some intelligence gathering, going to talk to people who are putting these together and saying, tell me about your company culture. Tell me what you're looking for. Tell me what your process is. And so networking, everyone knows, you know, when you're looking for a job or you're looking to fill a job, networking becomes uh, even more important than it is now because you want to connect to those people that in some cases will completely bypass this screening evaluation process and get your resume on the decision maker's desk. So what you're saying is if you want to beat an AI system, you need to talk to a person. Yes. <laughs> Anyone want to add on to that? Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I've, I've, I've coached um, college kids. I've coached military, coming out of the military. I tell them all the same thing. The resume is A, yours. It's not a legal document. It's, just, it's, it's your information, so you can put anything you want on there. But it, until you go to the application, and that's where they're going to get you. So if they don't match up, that's, gonna, that's, that's bad. So the number, the number two thing, though, is a resume is a key to open the door to get an interview with either the recruiter or with the manager. So you really want it to be tight. You really want it to be succinct. You, if you have been in the business as long as I have, you may have a two-page resume or a three-page resume. I don't tell people to go over, over really over three. I mean, I've had a very long, storied career. When you're coming out of college, there's just ways of putting things. Like, you don't need to put up that you got the degree. I already know you got the degree. Tell me what you did when you were um, uh, interning. What did you do in the internship? Was it all you? Were you part of a group? What part of the group was it? Information is power. The more information you can give a recruiter in a succinct way, the easier it is they're going to want to talk to you. I think I really struggle with this question. And, and I, I think it's partially, I, I could see a future where we head towards more honesty in the market. Uh, because of AI tools, because there's a bit of an arms race going on where it's the kind of coaching and then we kind of try to get around the coaching. We kind of go back and forth between the company and the talent and the company and the talent to try to kind of game the systems back and forth. But the, the benefit with a lot of these AI tools is you've got a scale that we've never had before and you're able to look at a lot of different things that were never able to be kind of consumed before and brought into one place. And so I, I think ultimately where this is going is that as it becomes so big and the scale becomes so large as a candidate, it, it's going to get past what's manageable for me as a candidate to game anymore. And once we get past that point, there, there's gonna be a little just more honesty in the job market here, I think, where you'll get to a point where companies will be able to see the talent market, be able to find the people, people will be able to find the companies they're looking forward to. Um, so I, I see a brighter future with the kind of direction that's heading, and, and a little bit less of the kind of the man versus machine and a little bit more of a don't, don't democratized you, don't place. Don't you imagine that there's gonna be a vendor next week who says, oh, here's all the cultures, here's how they do the evaluations, we've reverse engineered their uh, data models, and so give us your resume and we'll get it into their systems. Yeah, I, I think so. Right. And then I think there'll be kind of a, a way to fight back on the other side. I, I think about um, people that were putting white text in the back of their resume. Uh -huh. That was a big thing for a very long time, just every skill you could think of, put it in the white text and the it humans worked. can't see it, but the machines can. Right. <laughs> But eventually the machines figure that out. And they say, okay, that, we're, we're gonna get rid of that kind of background text. They're, they're starting to use it a little bit differently. I mean, it, you can fool them for a little bit. There's, there's always a window. And then you kind of, that arms race continues. And I think it's, at some point it's gonna get outside of the, the bounds of what humans can continue to keep up with. And I, I think that's gonna be a bit of a relief for a lot of candidates in the market. Okay. Got any I have no opinions. Good. <laughs> Derek, hey, Derek. <laughs> yeah, well, this should be a first. <laughs> So Derek, um, uh, we've got these intelligent tools running amok in the operation. When can we let them run on their own? Oh boy, we're gonna have it. <laughs> we already had this discussion, John, and I'm glad you asked the question. I don't, I equate this, I equate things to, to, to bring it down to a, a level where everybody can kind of understand it. So I look at it this as that AI just was born. Machine learning has been around for a long time, but it's starting to grow. So it, it, it's, we're in the infancy of this, just like we're in the infancy with social media. We're seeing a lot of things change in the last five years. I'm seeing machine learning learning. But as you raise a child, you don't just put a 10-year-old in charge of themselves for dinner. You, don't give it, you show them how to use the oven. You show them how to use a knife. You explain to them the tools. You hold their hand. 
when you're not there, when you're going to school, you'd say, what do we do? We look both ways, right? These are all things that we're learning. So we're teaching the machine. Eventually, I think that a machine will always need to be monitored. Because as my grandmother once told me with my mom when I was fighting with her when I was 16, she said, son, you have to understand, you're always going to be her little boy. Okay? To this day, I talk, I talk to my mom every week. And you know why? Because if I don't, she calls me and why didn't you call me? She wants to know what's going on with my life. And I, still, and I still call her and ask her questions about life, about relationships. What should I do about this? What should I do? What do you think about this, mom? And that's what I think we're always going to be with machine learning. If we let it go, then I'm seeing a cybernet. Then I'm seeing a cybernet. Cool. Cool. Anybody else? I do have opinions on this. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I actually agree with you. I, I don't think you can ever turn hiring people over to a machine, especially if people are going to be working with other people. Um, you know, the, the human factors. Machines, machines are really good at things that you can quantify, and, and humans cannot be defined at that level ever. Um, we, are, we are qualitative messes, um, as it should be. And so I, I just think that if, if you are asking machines to give opinions about who should be hired to work with somebody else, you better make sure that those opinions are useful and, and actually work. And and as your teams change, as you change, as your company grows, as, as the things, as technology changes how we work and what we're doing, all of that has to evolve with human supervision. So, so I just want to beat this around a little bit. Most of the solutions that we heard about today, um, you take a great big stack of resumes, you put them in, and out comes a little small stack at the bottom. Right? And it's scale, right? It's a thousand to a hundred or a thousand to ten that you're talking about. Just exactly who's going to supervise that, right? You're certainly not going to hire people to go back and double check every decision that the machine made. So you have to. You, you have, have to. to. You have legal liability to make sure that that stack of ten is not discriminating against protected classes. I that's think. that's an interesting assertion. I uh, I think I have a. So I, I think something else to think about here is that I don't see AI replacing exactly what recruiters do. So taking the, the stack of resumes and finding the candidate, they, they might eventually be able to do that. I think where they really succeed today is being able to take a million resumes that recruiters weren't able to look at and surface if there's any gems in there. Oh, and that's so interesting. Taking a look at not, not replacing the recruiter, but augmenting or being able to kind of serve up like, hey, you, you passed on a lot of these people, but this one might actually be someone you might want to take another look at. I think that's where we see a lot of benefit and maybe a little less of that kind of like ethical crunch of like, are we replacing somebody? Are we getting humans out of the equation? But really tackling a slightly different problem that humans are not qualified to do. I think, I think that's something that I keep running across in, in my, my looking at, at AI is that the real value is not some cost savings today. The real value is that we're going to be able to do things that we weren't able to do before. Yeah. And that's, that's hard to sell in contemporary management structures, but it's where we are, where we are. The, the idea that there's an ROI on this stuff, Stephen, you'll appreciate this. The idea that there's an ROI on this stuff is a misplaced way of thinking about it. If you look to use this stuff as cost savings, you'll put yourself out of business. Um, all right, next question. Who, who's liable? <laughs> The employer is liable for its hiring decisions full stop. It does not matter what technology you use. Um, so if your technology is biased or offering discriminatory sets of 10 resumes as the top choices, um, you are the one who's responsible for that. And you're responsible to the people who are being discriminated against in a disparate um, impact case that can be brought by them or by a government agency and if you discriminate against someone specifically 
you could be liable to them. Now, hiring cases are very hard to prove um, because most people who are discriminated against never know that they were. Um, but but when, when you start to see the numbers in your company change, um, people will notice. So it's, you know, even if you are not required to track your demographics under federal contracting requirements, everyone who uses technology in hiring should be tracking their, their ratios and, and making sure that they're in disparate impact compliance. So I'm going to skip by. Did you really say that you can't hold the vendor accountable for the quality of the work? I did work? not say that, but that <laughs> depends on what the contract is, how the courts are going to enforce those kinds of contracts, um, and whether there's some sort of civil workaround if the if the vendors have a very clear indemnity or, or re release of liability as part of the sales agreement. But we're, get, we're gonna see a lot more contractual litigation over these issues. But it, it'll, be, it'll be determined based on contract law, probably. So do you think contract law is gonna evolve? What AI produces is evidence in reams. Yes, it does. Discoverable evidence in reams that didn't used to be there. So, so if I have a hint that there's something hinky in your hiring process, and I can get an attorney to set up a case, then I can discover the data in your recruiting system and do all sorts of things with it. Yes, yeah? yes. Evidence is much easier to acquire <laughs> and analyze now. <laughs> yes, it is. Right. Every it's it's not just data; it's evidence. Right. Yeah. I think that's a. I think that's a really interesting point with uh, why AI in this sentence really stands out, because I think as it stands today, there there may be bias, or or there there is bias in, in most companies' hiring systems, but it's not discoverable. And so the unfortunate thing is, even if the AI may have less bias than your current system, if it's discoverable, then suddenly there's, there's a barrier there that didn't exist before. And so I, I would love to see that kind of um, legal environment evolve somehow to yep. allow for more experimentation in that kind of AI space, because I, I think it frankly has the potential to be a lot better than what's going on in the human-based systems today, which you cannot discover, you cannot track, you cannot understand in the same way. And um, I, again, I think we're, we would be in a better world if we could understand the bias in a very quantitative way. Uh, by using AI systems. So one of the things that concerns me in, in terms of diversity is the fact that if I try to match a key set of attributes to my leadership or my top performers and those leaders are all white males, maybe what comes out of the machine is all white males and I need to, I need to account for that. Cool. Okay. Maybe the last question. Richard. You don't get the question that's on here. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> you, did the, you did this to yourself. <laughs> did this. That's fair. So, so Amazon just canned a long project because they couldn't get, my view, they couldn't get the bias implicit in the history of their company out of the data, and so they couldn't build an intelligent system that would be free from bias. Um, your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting story. And if anyone hasn't had a chance yet, take a look at the kind of articles that kind of swarmed around that. It came out a couple months ago. Amazon had been running a, some kind of system. I think it, it's a little bit unclear whether or not the system was enacted. I, I didn't think it was. I, I don't think it was. I, I think production. it was a group of engineers that were thinking about or working through, and this is just me speculating at this point because I, I don't have inside information over there. Um, but I, I think it's interesting that they shut it down. And I, I think it's more to do with that discoverability than it is to do with the actual effectiveness of what they were looking through. Because um, I, I do think that Amazon, with nearly 500,000 employees now, they must get millions of resumes every year, absolutely millions. And to be able to look through all of them, they have to find a way to scale recruiting. And, and to think through, I, I know um, the LEO team here, they, they've done the kind of math on kind of how many recruiters would it take to look through a million resumes, and how could we kind of replace that with a scaled solution. I, I think they do need something like that. It, it was a bit of a, a step back, I think, from a uh, kind of media perspective and just the space in general, um, because it really, it, it took a hit from kind of this, Amazon is hiring men, or their, their history is based on men, so this is what they're doing, and it just kind of took off from there. Um, but I think what they were doing was the right effort in the right way, and I think they shut it down before it kind of got too bad, but um, I think going forward, they, they could have really had a lot more success there. 
And I, I don't think this is the end of that space. Mm -hmm. And companies kind of looking into this to try to see how can we scale recruiting, how can we find these candidates in the rough. Um, yeah. You know, the, the theory is that you can eliminate bias, right? The, the, the theory is that you can eliminate bias. And, and it might be the case that bias is just like a steady breeze and you gotta, you gotta tack against the steady breeze to go in a yeah. straight line and that you can mitigate bias and you can mitigate the impact of bias. But the idea that what you can do is prevent human beings from having a point of view and keep that out of their data, that seems, that seems like an extravagant hope to me. Yeah, and I, I think that goes back to that augmentation piece. Uh, I think if Amazon was hoping to replace and get rid of recruiters, um, I, I, I would hope that that's not where their head was at with it. I, I think um, experimentation in this area, though, should be uh, expanded, and we continue to kind of work in that space and continue to innovate there. Um, because the, the worst thing that could happen is we just say, full stop, let's just keep recruiting with humans as we are today and just scale mm -hmm. that and just hire thousands and thousands of recruiters. I'm sorry to the recruiters in the audience. <laughs> um, I, I know it's a... It's, it's something that we're gonna need forever, but at the same time, something's gotta change eventually here, especially when you get to that scale. I'm, I'm gonna just weigh in real quick. I have a, a really, is a very good friend, very dear friend, he runs a company called Aspen Advisors, and that's exactly what he does. He goes, he's hired by companies to come in and to tell them what is good and what is bad, and uh, Andrew uh, Godomsky, I'm gonna give him a shout out with Aspen Advisors. Him and I have chatted many times about this. Um, I've gone through the Myers-Briggs dystopian process. Uh, there's, this, there's all these different wild things that are happening out there. And, but the thing is, at the end of the day, and, and Andrew will tell you this, he'll bring you the data. And he just gives you the data. He says he analyzes and he gives it to you, the good and the bad. And he has been told by companies, here's your check, thanks, and they never did a dang thing. Every day. The companies need to step up. We can, I mean, we can, I can go, I can go in and, and, and evaluate your entire recruiting team. I can come in for two weeks and tell you exactly who should be here and who shouldn't. Just by listening to the conversations. After 23 years, I'm pretty sure I can tell you that. But I got to have you accept those findings. That's where bias starts. It doesn't start with the machines. It starts with the very top. And if they're not willing to listen and trickle it down, it's never going to change. Awesome. So we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, who wants to toss a hardball at one of these batters here? A quick question. So the machine will collect data. Do you think that privacy policy and privacy law are hollow promises as every prospective employer is going to collect your data? This is especially concerning in the UK where the right to be forgotten exists. How do you ensure that such privacy exists for the years to come? This question is for Heather. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, privacy is a really important right, but it is also one of our most fragile rights in that we can very easily give it up by clicking a box saying, I agree, and if you don't know what you're agreeing to, you know. So, so there are some things that laws can do. GDPR, I think, is, is an interesting compromise between privacy and usability of data. Um, and and the, the most important thing that we're gonna figure out is, is who has the burden. You know, is it something that the person who has the data must inform you of directly and get your affirmative knowledge and consent? Or is it enough to have a privacy policy on a website, which is where California's new um, data privacy law, that's, that's their basic thing. There are some security things, but, but basically the burden is completely on the person involved to come back and say, what data do you have and please take it off your website. And most of us have no idea who has our data and what they're doing with it. You know, that it's, it's, it's a pretty clear transaction with the Safeway card, right? They hand me their card, the deal is I get a discount in exchange for my data. I buy all my, cost, my toilet paper at Costco. They're still trying to figure out why I don't use toilet paper. You know, and, and I'm, I'm okay with this. I, I'm okay with this. But, but, but for most of these, for most data, the subject has no idea. And, and anonymized data is another approach. 
But the truth is, is that there's no way to truly anonymize data. Um, it's, it's very easy with almost a tiny bit of context to, to connect it and figure out what's going on. Uh, you, you said companies will just collect data. I, I think that is not true from my experience. And, and I would not be as pessimistic kind of on, on that front there. I, I, I talk to a lot of teams about GDPR because I'm on a people analytics team at Facebook. Um, GDPR is actually part of what I do within my day job is working with that, understanding it better, like figuring out how this applies, how we work with it. Um, it is a massive conversation going on right now. And, and so I, it's something just from the inside I'm, I'm thrilled about to be able to kind of see how that works and see how that plays out. And employee privacy is absolutely at the utmost concern. Because I, I think as soon as one company messes that up, the whole thing comes crashing down about how we understand this, how we can help our employees. It would be an, a massive step back for the entire industry. And so I, I think this is something that, within the people in the analytics space at least, is highly, highly uh, being watched. And let me just add, everybody know what a cookie is? Yep. Not a cookie that we just had after lunch, but the cookies on the website. Has anybody else noticed that all of a sudden the websites that you frequently go to are now giving a pop-up saying, hey, we use cookies? That's GDPR. So when you click OK, then you're saying, OK, you can, you can follow every click I do. OK, I work for a company called Comscore. That's what we did. All, I hired data analytics people for almost three years. And that's all we did is we tracked data specifically for the movie industry. And when you're at home and you're at Comcast and you're clicking the channel and you're like, and the a commercial comes on and you sit through the commercial, I'll know it. Now, I don't know who you are but I'll collect all that data and I sell it to the advertising agency. That's how Comscore and Nielsen make money. That's what ratings are all about. But you're giving them that information. When you get that cable box, you're telling the cable company in your contract that you sign, they're going to be monitoring all of your information. So that's where it's gonna go down to. And I think probably the key takeaway for corporate HR people is collect the minimum amount of data you need um, explain what you're going to do with it and only use it for that purpose. Yeah. Really? And watch out for Fair Credit Reporting Act. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 really, the, the way to understand an organization is by collecting as much data as you can. That's going to be quite a tough balance to strike. And, and if you imagine being an HR leader going to the CEO saying, we don't want to understand what's going on in our workforce. We're only going to collect the minimum amount of data. I think that's a ticket to a short career. Well, we're, we're purposeful from a recruiting perspective. We, we're not going to use it for other marketing, say Intel products. We're not going to use it for other, we're not going to sell it to anybody. It's used for recruiting. If you're clicking in our database to apply for a job, it's only going to be for that purpose. Last bit, then this is to put each of you on the spot. Uh, there was, there was some talk early in the day about actionable insights. Um, so, so if you were going to tell somebody one thing to take away from this conversation or today in general or something you learned reading the newspaper in the hotel this morning, <laughs> what would it be? Start with you, Jeff. I think whatever you decide to implement today based on learnings, based on company offerings, Put a, put a pin in revisiting it in, in 12 months or less because things are going to change. You can't outsource responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> I would say uh, don't compare AI against the perfect. You, you have to compare it against what you're doing today. And what we're doing today is not perfect. Well, no worries. Uh, yeah, good, good. So you both just stole everything that I was going to say. <laughs> all of you, all three of you. Um, I guess my takeaway is this, we're not there yet. I don't think we're close. I really don't. I think, I, 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 don't, know, I don't know when. Um, I think we're going at a, we were going at a really fast speed, uh, almost breakneck. And then all of a sudden we hit a wall with GDPR. No offense to Facebook, we hit a wall, some stuff there. We, Amazon hit a wall. Um, once again, like I said, I can give you the information. It's up to you if you want to accept it. And that's, that's what I think the next big hurdle is going to be, is because there's going to be people like John out there and bringing you that data, and you're not going to like it sometimes. So how do you deal with it? So just to wrap this all up, a couple of things. One, 
is it would be a reasonable thing to take away from this conversation that you should stay away from this crap for as long as you can. And, 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 and I urge you not to do that. I urge you not to do that. This is the way that work is going to be from here going forward. It's going to be less certain. It's going to be less clear. It's going to be more experimental. This is what a flattening of the hierarchy looks like. And it's going to be augmented with technology. And so what you have to do is get your feet wet and try things. And, and try things to the point that there's some risk to you associated with those things, because that's how your companies are going to survive. You got to get in, you got to get in now, even though it's uncertain, even though it's, it's something other than perfectly clear. This is the make or break it for your company. And, and, and so get started. Second thing is, um, for just the tiniest bit of promotion, we wrote a, an incredible industry analysis at HR Examiner um, that looks at uh, trends and vendors inside of HR. 70% of them are recruiting vendors that we cover. Uh, you might want to stop at the HR Examiner site and see that, and you may want to follow us because we keep a steady pulse of information about the stuff going through there. Lastly, let me remind you who these people are. Derek Zeller. <laughs> he is the head of recruiting projects at Engage Talent. Richard Rosenau runs people analytics for Facebook. And, and by the way, they have 50 people on the people analytics team at Facebook. 50 people. This is coming to your town. Heather Bussing, uh, employment attorney. And Jeff Dunn, the head of college recruiting for Intel. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. And thank you.